Today we will be talking in brief about re-expansion pulmonary edema. So moving on to the topic proper, it is a non-cardiogenic form of pulmonary edema and it is a rare complication that is it usually occurs in less than 1% of the uh, 1% of the time but it is a fatal complication with mortality up to 20%. The com it is a complication which arises after a rapid decompressive treatment of pulmonary collapse secondary to pleural effusion pneumothorax or otolactasis. So it usually occurs within 24 hours of the drainage procedure and is characterized by hypoxemia and alveolar infiltrates in the re-expanded lung and it can even rarely occur in the contralateral lung. So it's usually a unilateral lung that has got the pulmonary edema but in very rare cases both the lungs can develop the pulmonary edema. So now moving on to a case, let's see, this is the first x-ray chest x-ray we saw is a patient with a massive left-sided pleural effusion we can see that there is a massive effusion which can which is even causing the trachea to be deviated to the opposite side that is the trachea trachea is deviated toward the right side so for this patient the treatment was done chest tube was in, inserted but after the insertion of the chest tube the patient developed cough hypoxia and then severe breathlessness breathlessness so again, the next chest x-ray was done and this is the second chest x-ray. We can see that uh, in the second chest x-ray, uh, on the left side, the lung has re-expanded and you can see the even the pleural effusion has decreased. So the uh, trachea is somewhat towards the center, but you can see there is no new non-homogeneous homogeneous opacities in the left middle zone and this is the patient has developed the pulmonary edema on the left side of the lung. So we can see that this collapsed lung has re-expanded in the second chest x-ray but there are new non-homogeneous opacities here. So this is the typical case of a re-expansion pulmonary edema. So now moving on to the pathophysiology of re-expansion pulmonary edema because of the sudden ventilation and perfusion of the chronically collapsed lung, it can precipitate increased permeability edema through a variety of mechanisms. And the first mechanism is as the lung re-expands, it promotes a robust influx of the inflammatory cells, which leads to the toxic mediated release of the toxic mediators from these cells, and this damages the alveolar capillary barrier. And also when this chronically hypoxic alveolar cells uh, in the area of atelectic lungs are exposed to a sudden increase in oxygen tension during the lung re-expansion, it will increase the production of oxygen-free radicals also. And overall, all these toxic mediators, oxygen-free radicals will damage the alveolar capillary barrier. And also, when the lungs re-expand, it can result in the sudden increase in the local perfusion due to the fall in pulmonary vascular resistance from the both from both lung re-expansion and the reversal of the hypoxic vasoconstriction. And this dramatic increase in capillary transmural pressure can mechanically injure the basement membrane of the alveolar capillary lining and it precipitate increase in the permeability edema, which is also called capillary stress failure. So now moving on to the various risk factor that will be attributed to the re-expansion pulmonary edema. So as I've already discussed in the pathophysiology, the more chronicity of the lung collapse, the more the days of the lung collapse, there is more risk of getting the re-expansion pulmonary edema. And also, it also depends on the rate of lung expansion. Faster you go for the re-expansion, it will increase the risk of edema. The other factor that increases the risk for pulmonary edema is the amount of pleural fluid and pneumothorax drain. That is, if the drain is is more than 1500 milliliter at a time, then there will be the increased risk of the edema. Now, moving on to the signs and symptoms, uh, it consists of persistent cough, that is cough usually for more than 20 minutes, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypoxemia, and overall hemodynamic instability. So in a patient who has just undergo, undergone the chest tube drainage and you suspect, uh, you highly suspect the patient has developed pulmonary edema because of the symptom, then you will do a chest x-ray or chest radiogram to confirm the diagnosis. In the chest radiogram, chest x-ray, you will see the presence of new opacities in the previously collapsed lung. And this uh, opacity usually progresses over the two days following the thoracosynthesis and then rapidly reverts if enough uh, treatment is given. Now, moving on to the other modalities of the uh, 
uh, chest radiogram. We can also go for computed uh, tomography. In tom computed tomography, we will see the ground glass opacities and it is usually uh, present in the periphery peripherals peripheral area and it is preference preferentially in the gravity dependent area. Other additional finding in the shitty chest include thickening of the interlobular septa, peribronchovascular band-like thickenings and poorly defined central lobular uh, micronodules. However, we should keep in mind that pleural effusion is not an usual finding in case of re-expansion pulmonary edema. Now, moving on to the treatment, treatment is usually supportive and it consists of the supportive measures like supplemental oxygen, steroids and cautious use of the diuretics. The When we keep the patient in lateral decubitus position on the affected side of the lungs in unilateral cases, it will reduce the pulmonary stunting and it improves oxygenation. And it is very important to uh, maintain the oxygenation in the patient without lung damage until the lung function is restored. Uh, so that we can overcome the initial high risk period. So for the patient who are not maintaining oxygen, even after the supplementation of the oxygen, we can go for non-invasive ventilation, like continuous positive airway pressure. And for the patient who are very sick and which, for which the symptom is very severe and who are not responding to the initial oxygen supplementation and non-invasive ventilation, we can also go for a orotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Now, moving on to the mode of mechanical ventilation. We know in cases of mechanical ventilation, positive in expiratory pressure therapy is the first choice of method for educate, educate oxygenation. So in there, in cases of re-expansion pulmonary edema, we know there will be two lungs, one lungs with pulmonary edema and the other lung, which will be the normal expanded lung. So if we provide the high positive in expiratory pressure therapy uh, for this patient, uh, is what happens in the both the lungs. We'll see one by one. In the affected lungs, application of positive pressure, it in inhibits the plasma leakage from the capillary arteries and interstitial tissue to the alveoli. And this will facilitate facilitates the oxygenation by maintaining a high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli. So the affected lung will benefit from the high positive and expiratory pressure therapy. But in case of the normal side of the lungs, the high positive pressure will increases the or will increase the normal lung. That is, it will overinflate the normal lungs and it will lead to the compression of the pulmonary artery because there will be increase in pulmonary resistance and this will lead to the decrease in supply of the uh, supply blood supply to the normal side of the lungs and which will automatically lead to the increase in blood supply to the uh, affected lungs. That is. Because the edematous, in the edematous lung, there will be more pulmonary blood flow. So since there will be more pulmonary blood flow to the edematous lung, it will lead to the uh, mismatch of the ventilation and perfusion and it will further re uh, reduce the oxygen supply to the affected lungs. So to avoid overinflation of the lung, normal lungs and to reduce the ventilation perfusion mismatch in the affected lung, we have to go for the low positive in expiratory pressure, low tidal volume and high O2 ventilatory care. Now moving on to asynchronous differential lung ventilation. In as we have already talked, there are two types of lung. One will be the affected lung and one will be the normal lung. So for such patient, we can use uh, two different ventilation and give the different uh, mode of ventilation to the, to the different lungs. So this is known as asynchronous differential lung ventilation. And in this, there is a differential ventilation of the bilateral lung through the double lumen intubation. So ideally, this is the ideal method to solve the ventilation perfusion mismatch by applying low PEEP and low tidal ventilation to the normal lung and high PEEP to the edematous lung. But it will require two ventilation ventilator and there are very few case reported reports where uh, it is reported that they have done the asynchronous differential lung ventilation in a patient with the uh, re-expansion pulmonary edema. However, it is important to note that in such few case reported reports, uh, it is shown that the patient usually have an improvement in the vital sign and arterial blood gas analysis uh, within three hours of the asynchronous ventilation. 
So now moving to the next mode of treatment that is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It is, however, a second line of treatment and because of its high cost and unavailability in every center, its uh, users are limited. However, in this, this veno venous ECMO uh, is also effective treatment for the patient with high risk, high mortality risks where the ventilation perfusion mismatch should be resolved by increase in blood saturation. So this is it for today. Thank you.